Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Glavnyov and I'd like to present our recent result connecting the fields of data structures and cryptography. This is a joint work with Xiao Guo, Tibo Oral, Sanu Park, and Vinod uh, Vaikun Tanatan. All right, so the outline of this talk is the following. First of all, we'll discuss um, the data structure models that we're gonna be working with, static data structures. Then we'll define a certain kind of cryptography, cryptography with preprocessing and the um, random oracle model. And finally, we'll prove um, some kind of equivalence between the, these two, between static data structures and cryptography with preprocessing. Namely, we'll prove that uh, better and better data structure lower bounds will give us better and better um, uh, crypto primitives and the other way around. Uh, provable crypto primitives would give us proofs of uh, new data structure lower bounds. All right, so let's start with data structures. We're gonna be considering static data structures. In a static data structure, you are given uh, some input, say, um, the road network, all, all American uh, uh, roads, okay? You have forever to preprocess them because essentially like in the next two weeks, this network is not gonna be really changed. So you have forever to preprocess this, um, uh, your input, but once you're done with preprocessing, I want you to quickly answer a certain kind of queries. For example, I'm giving you a pair of cities, Boston and Chicago, you should quickly find the shortest or short uh, path between the two cities. I give you another pair of cities uh, and uh, I want you to quickly find the answer again. That is, you can only look at a few memory cells and do only a few um, operations and compute the shortest or maybe a short path between, uh, between this pair of cities. So this is uh, an example of a static data structure problem. You're given an input, you have unlimited resources to preprocess the input, but once you're done, I want you to quickly, efficiently answer all queries. And um, we assume that you know all the queries in advance, right? You know all pairs of cities in advance, uh, and also typically the number of uh, queries, the number of pairs of cities is, uh, is polynomial in the input line. So maybe a huge polynomial like n to the 10 where n is the input line, but it's still usually a polynomial in the input line. All right, so formally static data structure is the following thing. You have n inputs, you preprocess them with unbounded resources, unbounded computational resources into some S memory cells. And now given a query, you, you answer it in time T. And here there are several ways to measure time. Um, it's, it's, often, uh, it's often measured as a number of memory cells you are looking at. And you are given computations uh, on, on the T memory cells for free. So we just count the number of memory cells you're looking at to answer a query. So there are two important parameters, S, the amount of space you're using, and C, the query time, how much time you spend to answer a query. All right, so we usually say that the data structure is efficient if your space is close to optimal, close to linear, maybe N times some polylog in N, where N is the input length, and your query time is reasonable, maybe polylog n or n raised to, to a tiny power, like n to the epsilon for a tiny constant epsilon. Okay, so what do we know about uh, static data structures? Every data structure problem has two trivial solutions. First, you can read the input, and then in your unbounded preprocessing stage, you can pre-compute answers to all possible queries. Recall that you know all the queries in advance, you know all the pairs of cities. So you can pre-compute all answers, but uh, this, uh, this uses too much space, right? In this solution, you use uh, space equals m number of queries, which might be a huge polynomial in the input. We don't wanna waste that much space. But your query time here is ideal, it's just constant. The other trivial solution for every data structure problem is don't do any preprocessing, just store the input. Here, your space usage is ideal, is optimal. You are only using the 
uh, information theoretical minimum amount of space n. But for every interest and for every non-trivial problem, your query time would be linear in n. You would have to read all of the input. So here we have, uh, in the first solution we use too much space, in the second solution we use too much time, and the field of data structures is about trade-offs. For what problems, um, there are data structures which use a reasonable amount of uh, time in the query stage and a reasonable uh, amount of space. Okay, as always, a random problem, that is most problems, uh, require either trivial space or trivial time. Okay, so for most problems, there are no, uh, there are essentially no solutions in between the, of these two trivial solutions. But as always, the challenge is to find an explicit problem which cannot be solved efficiently. By explicit, we mean a problem which we can, you know, describe. Say a problem from a reasonable complexity class, like P and P, or even E to the NP. All right, and here, the best known Laura bound for an explicit problem was proven back in the 80s. It has the following form. Query time is at least log of the number of queries divided by log of space over the length of the input. And let me parse this bound for you. Recall that M, the number of queries, is, is, a, is polynomial in N. Uh, so when space is linear, we know how to prove a logarithmic, a logarithmic lower bound on the query time. But for super linear space, we know nothing. We can only prove that query time must be at least constant, but yeah, clearly it must be at least constant. So since the 80s, we don't know how to improve on this bound. And the bound is, again, for linear space, we can prove logarithmic, um, logarithmic uh, query time, lower bound, and for super linear space, we can't prove it. All right, this is a static data structure model. Now, uh, let's talk about cryptography with preprocessing. For any interesting kind of cryptography, we need um, hard functions. We need functions, uh, say one-way functions, which are easy to compute but hard to invert. Uh, but that's a rule of thumb that you ju don't just develop such a function on your own, right? If you come up with a function which, uh, which you think might be hard to invert, then most likely someone will break it in a couple of months. So you, we usually rely on standardized functions and say your hard function was standardized in the 80s. Most likely the input length or output length was uh, not too large back then. And now given, given modern computers with large amount of space and um, given a lot of time, we can probably break those functions. We can invert this function using a lot of space and a lot of time in the processing stage. There are many attacks, uh, attacks like this, say rainbow tables attacks, uh, but the, the, the most trivial attack, uh, attack is the following. Say you, uh, you had a function f, a small n, and nowadays my computer has an uh, amount of space, has two to the n space. Then clearly for every output I can store a corresponding input, I can invert this function f, and then I can invert, I can break any cryptography which you based on the hardness of this function f, okay? So what do we do about this? We can either come up with a new function f, test it, uh, standardize it, publish it, but it's gonna take years. Instead, we would like to have some compiler, right? Or we would like to have a procedure which takes this, this old function f, which we don't like anymore. It had, say, too small of n. But we apply some simple procedure to it, immunization, and we get a new function g, which has much longer input, much longer output, and more importantly, it's still secure. If, if, if uh, it's secure even against computers with that much space, even against computers with um, with amount of space two to the n. That would be an ideal ideal solution. We we'll take a function which used to be secure against computers with. Uh, a little of uh, little space and make it. Uh, uh, and make it a new function g, 
which is secure even against the computers with, uh, say, two to the n space. Okay, so uh, we'll prove that this kind of cryptography is actually exactly equivalent to data structure lower bounds. So this data structure uh, lower bounds against data structures are exactly equivalent uh, to this cryptographer with preprocessing in the random Oracle model. The main result of, uh, of our work is that, yeah, this kind of cryptography is equivalent to data structure lower bounds for a specific class of problems, but this is a quite natural and quite large class of data structure problems. It includes all geometric problems, say three sum, nearest neighbors, polygon containment, many, many other problems. Uh, instead of formally defining this class of problems, let me, let me show you an example, the three sum problem. All right, so in the three sum problem, uh, yeah, first, first let me define the classical algorithmic, not data structure, but algorithmic version of the three sum problem. Here you're given n numbers, and the goal is to check whether there are three of them, AI, AJ, and AK, such that AI plus AJ equals AK. Uh, also, it looks like a problem about numbers, so maybe some combinatorial problem. It's actually the main problem in computational geometry. This problem is probably as hard as many, many uh, problems in computational geometry. If you can solve this problem efficiently, you can solve geometry efficiently and the other way around. Okay, so uh, it's easy to solve this problem in, in quadratic time. It was actually conjectured uh, that you cannot do any better, but a long and beautiful line of work improved on quadratic, uh, on quadratic uh, running time by some polylog factors. So the modern version of the three sum conjecture says that, okay, maybe you can win some polylog factors, but you cannot beat uh, the quadratic bound by a polynomial factor. You cannot solve the three sum problem in time n to the 1.99, okay? So this is a famous uh, good conjecture and we base hardness of many, many problems on this conjecture. Okay, so this is algorithm, uh, the algorithmic version of the three sum problem. There is also the data structure version of the same problem. It's often called three sum indexing. Here you are given n numbers and since this is a data structure version of the problem, you are doing some preprocessing. So you are, you are uh, allowed to preprocess the n input numbers into some s memory cells, s numbers, such that later, given the number b, you can quickly check whether there are two inputs, a, i, and n, j, which sum up to a b. And again, there are two important parameters, s, how many, numbers you store and see the query time. How much time do you need to answer this query whether B is a pairwise sum of the inputs. Okay, given n numbers, preprocess them, and then uh, you should be uh, able to quickly answer queries. Each query is B, check whether B is pairwise sum of the inputs. Um, so um, this, uh, this data structure problem has many connections to the algorithmic version uh, of 3SAM. Uh, again, there are two trivial solutions. Um, first, I can just store all pairwise sums of the inputs. For this, I will need space and square. But then using some binary search, in essentially in logarithmic time, I'll be able to answer every query. So I would have very good query time, but my space usage here would be n square. Uh, another trivial solution for this problem would be to store the input, maybe maybe sorted input. So my space usage is ideal, uh, but then for each query, I would have to do some, you know, uh, this two finger, two finger algorithm or some, some standard to sum algorithm, uh, and it, it would take uh, linear linear time. So here I kind of use too much space, here I use too much time, again. And there was a conjecture, and there, there is this um, data structure version of the three sum conjecture, which claims that actually there are no solutions in between. Goldstein et al conjectured that 
once you're using subquadratic space, you're immediately in this region. Your query time must be at least linear. Uh, we'll use cryptography right now to break this conjecture. We'll show that no, in fact, we can do truly subquadratic space and um, some non trivial query time. We'll do this via connection, via this new connection between cryptography and data structures. Okay, so the crypto tool that we're going to be using for this is called a function, uh, it's called function inversion. Okay, so assume we have a function f from the set of integers from 1 to n to the set of integers from 1 to n. The function inversion uh, problem is the following. We want to preprocess f into some space s. So we want to store some number, some s numbers, so that we could invert the function f at every point in time t. That is, if you are given a y, in time t you can find an x such that f of x equals y. Okay, so in 1980, Hellman showed that um, there is a non-trivial um, way to invert a function for every function f. And it was later rigorously studied and proven by Fiat and Nao. Okay, so they, they proved that given a function f, you can always invert it in some uh, space s and time t such that s cubed times t as um, at most n cubed. All right, uh, for example, you can take s and t both to be n to the three quarters. Um, I'll show you how to do it, but in a special case. And in this case, when f is a bijection and when s and t are both square root of n, roughly square root of n. Okay, so once again, uh, let f be a bijection from uh, the integers from one to n to the integers from one to n, we want to invert it at every point using space square root of n and query time square root of n. So how do we do this? First, we define a directed graph where we have directed edges from x to f of x, or every x. Okay? So clearly the out degree of every point in our graph is exactly one. On the other hand, for bijections, the in degree must also be one. So we have a directed graph where all out and in degrees are exactly one. So this graph must be just a bunch of directed cycles. It must be a union of directed cycles. Let me look at one of those cycles. I pick any, point, I, uh, any vertex here and call it a landmark. And I say this is one of my landmarks. Now I skip square root of n vertices and say this, this vertex is another landmark. And I keep doing this. Okay, so now in my data structure, I store all landmarks. And for each of them, I also store a link to the previous landmark. Okay, that's it. That's the whole data structure. I store landmarks and for each of them, a link to the previous one. So clearly my space usage is roughly square root of n because each time when I store something, I skip square root of n vertices. I store something, I skip square root of n vertices. So I store at best square root, uh, square root of n numbers. Okay, so it remains to show that I can invert f in time square root of n, given this information, given landmarks and links to the previous ones, right? So what does it mean to invert f? It means you, you give me some y, which equals f of x, and I need to find this x. Y is some vertex of this graph. And since in this graph I have directed edges from X to F of X, this means that X is the previous vertex in this cycle. Here is the X. So you give me this Y, I wanna find this X. I start in this point Y and I apply the function F to it. It moves me along the cycle. I'm now here. I apply the function F again. I'm here, oh, sorry, I'm here. So I keep applying the function f and at some point I will reach uh, a landmark. Once I'm at a landmark, I can jump to the previous landmark because I have this link and I keep applying f until I get to x, right? So at some point I will find x, I will invert the function f. Good, so how many uh, steps have I made? 
at most square root of n, at most the length of this arc. Good, so we just inverted a permutation in time and space square root of n. Hellman, Fiat, uh, Hellman, Fiat, and Naor showed how to do it for any function f, not necessarily bijection, and how you can do it uh, for different trade-offs between sp uh, space and time. Okay, so now we're gonna use the scriptor tool to break a conjecture for geometric problem in data structures, to, to, to construct an inter, uh, a non-trivial data structure for the three-sum indexing problem. Recall that in this three-sum problem, we're given n numbers, we wanna preprocess them into some s numbers, and then given a query b, we wanna check whether b is a pairwise sum of the inputs. All right, so let me define the following trivial function f. It takes two indices from one to n and outputs the sum of the corresponding inputs, ai plus aj, okay? Uh, okay, let's note three properties of this function f. First of all, f is super easy to compute. There is nothing to do. You just take two numbers and sum them up. It's very easy to compute. Then the domain of f, the number of inputs, is n square, right? Uh, there are n possibilities for the first index, n possibilities for the, uh, for the second index, so there are n square inputs. And since outputs are pairwise sums of n numbers, by some Hessian without loss of generality, you can assume that the range of the function is of size n square, maybe 10 n square. Those are pairwise sums of n inputs, so by some Hessian you can always make them integers from one to rough n square. So without loss of generality, we assume that both the domain and range of this function is of size n square. And finally, once you invert f, you exactly solve my three-sum problem. The three-sum problem is, given b, check whether it's a pairwise sum of the inputs. If you invert f, you solve the three-sum uh, three problem. Uh, luckily, uh, we know how to invert a every function f, as long as you can efficiently compute f. Recall that while going along the cycle, we keep, we keep evaluating f, so we need f to be efficiently computable, but we have it for free for our f. And also we want the domain and range to be small, right? The domain and range is that main capital N parameter in the function version problem. So we want that parameter to be small. Luckily here we have it. So by applying this Hellman, uh, this uh, Hellman Fiat or treat, we can solve three sum uh, for every s and c satisfying some equation. s cubed times t is n to the six. In particular, we can take truly subquadratic space and non-trivial time and break the, the previous conjecture about the hardness of three sum and the data structure world. All right, so this is uh, how we can use cryptography to solve data structures. But in fact, the, the connection works in the other direction as well. Uh, we can use data structure hardness, data structure lower bounds um, to build crypto primitives. I'll show you an example. Um, I'll show you like three lines of code so that if you believe uh, that three sum is hard for data structures, the three lines of code will turn function f with input and output of length n into a hard, provably hard function with larger input, larger output, which is secure against computers with a lot of space, say, say with two to the n space. So we start uh, with a function f from n, bit, uh, from n bits to n bits. Now we define any function f prime, which extends the length of the output. Probably the, the simplest way to do it is to evaluate f twice with, uh, with, uh, um, at, at, at two different inputs. So I have a function f prime, which takes roughly n bits and outputs uh, two n bits. And now I define a hard function g. This function g is from roughly two n bits to two n bits. It takes two inputs and just sums up f prime evaluated at these two points. If three sum is hard for data structures, then this function g is secure even against computers with a lot of preprocessing power. 
uh, with a lot of, say, space. Was, uh, against computers with 2% space. If you don't believe that three sum is hard, but you really believe that nearest neighbors is hard or some other geometric problem is hard, we can construct, G, we can construct secure crypto functions in a, in a similar way. All right, uh, but here we need hardness of three sum or any related problem. So we also prove that three sum is actually somewhat hard. Uh, any static data structure which solves three sum with query time t must use space at least n to the one plus one over t. This gives some interesting results as long as t is sublogarithmic. So this lower bound actually matches the best known lower bounds against any data, uh, for any data structure problem. So we don't really hope to prove stronger lower bounds for three sum because we don't really know how to do it for any problem. Um, clearly for provable cryptography, uh, we would like to, to, to have provable data structure lower bounds, which are even stronger than this one. But such, um, we know some, some barriers. It's not gonna be easy to prove strong lower bounds than the ones we currently know. There are some barriers in say circuit complexity. All right, uh, thank you, thank you for your attention.